Thank you for joining us today for our presentation, The Role of Peer Groups in Creating Justice. I am Reverend Hector J. Hernandez, and I serve as the Connect Coordinator of the National Benevolent Association, as well as the convener of the Prison and Jail Ministries Peer Group. I am also the convener of the Hispanic Pastors and, and Leaders Peer Group, who by the way is our newest peer learning and wellness group. The MBA is the Health and Social Services General Ministry of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ of the United States and Canada. And our mission is to inspire and to connect people and ministries of the church in the creation of communities of compassion and care, as well to advocate for the well being of humanity. For more than 130 years of history, MBA's ministry has been called to care for the least of this, has been called to, to root all our initiatives in the value and dignity of human life in serving a world that God so loves. However, it takes more than compassion and empathy to accomplish this mission. This mission also creates the responsibility to act, to be part of the solution, to act in creating equity and justice for everyone. And one of the ways that MBA creates spaces for equity and justice work is through connecting the people and ministries of the church in our peer learning and wellness groups. And the peer learning and wellness group provide an opportunity for leaders in similar ministry roles to engage in collaboration, encouragement, mutual dialogue, spiritual renewal, and of course, peer-to-peer -peer learning. These cohorts join together in monthly online, meet, online meetings and also in various in-person gathering for a set period of time, typically between one or two years, most of the peer groups two years. And this sacred journey provide all participants time for rest and renewal, time to share joyfully in, in healing conversations and group learning with other who truly, truly, truly understand the challenges, challenges and gift of faith-based work in our current world. With us today are some members of two different cohorts of the prison and jail ministries, peer learning and wellness groups. We have members from the first cohort from 2016 through 2018, and some members from the actual cohort that will conclude in a few months, 2018 through uh, 2020. And this peer group was developed as an extension of the work of the MBA Prison and Jail Ministries Initiative, and in conversation with ministry partners who express a need to connect prison and jail ministry leaders in smaller groups, smaller peer groups settings, designed to cultivate peer support, encouragement, mutual dialogue, spiritual renewal, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So, Allow me to introduce Reverend Tiffany Curtis, who is the co-convener of the current prison and jail ministry cohort and our moderator for today. Tiffany. Thank you, Hector. Yes, I'm Reverend Tiffany Curtis. And as Hector mentioned, I'm the co-convener of the current prison and jail ministries cohort. So I'm honored to be able to work with him on that and with some of these wonderful folks who are with us today. 
And um, I was also a member of the first prison and jail ministries um, cohort, along with some of our other panelists. In addition to this work with the NBA, I am the pastor of First Christian Church of Santa Fe and the co-founder and lead organizer of the Santa Fe Faith Network for Immigrant Justice. So I am honored to be here today and to moderate today's discussion with our wonderful panelists, all of whom I truly respect and admire. And my own experience with the prison and jail ministries peer groups has been very transformative in my own ministry and activism work as, and has supported me through various transitions um, during these years. And I continue to learn so much from and be so blessed by the companionship of our peer groups. So it really is um, my honor and a delight to be part of today's discussion. So I'd like to go ahead and get us started. We're gonna do introductions first. And so I'll pass the mic to our first panelist and we'll begin our round of introductions. Our panelists are going to share their names, their titles and the names of their ministries in this first round of introductions. And then we'll move on to our next question. So Sharon, would you please introduce yourself and your ministry? Yes. Thank you, Tiffany. Apostle Sharon Cosby coming for, to you from the great city of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I serve as the founding pastor and senior servant of In the Spirit Ministries. And through that ministry, we founded another organization, Oklahoma Family Empowerment Center, which I serve as the executive director there. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to uh, pass it on to Al McCarr. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon, and, and it's really a pleasure to be part of this um, uh, conversation with you all today. Um, my name is Amilcar Valencia. I'm the executive director of Refugio Ministry, an organization based uh, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia and we're serving families and people who are detained at one of the largest detention centers here in, in the United States. Um, and our mission is to provide assistance to the families as well to connect uh, people who are incarcerated at this immigration detention facility with resources and advocates for their freedom. Um, so I'd like to be part of this ministry, uh, this peer group, and it has been a great experience for me. We're gonna share more about this in a few minutes, but I just wanna uh, say that um, I'm so proud to be part of this amazing team. I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Reverend Nora Jacob. Thanks, Emil Carr. Good morning, everybody. I'm Reverend Nora Jacob, the Restorative Justice Director and Acting Executive Director of Urban Mission Community Partners, a nonprofit out in Pomona, California. Whew, that's a mouthful. And at the heart of my ministries, I do several things in the free, so-called free world in terms of uh, restorative justice, restorative practices and reentry. But at the heart of it, I have been going into a men's prison in Southern California every week to facilitate accountability and healing groups. And so that's the lens through which I explore and see prison. And uh, very gratefully, I'm part of this, this discussion this morning. So let me pass it on now to Paul. Thanks, Nora. Uh, Nora says, good morning. I say good afternoon. Just as a reminder, we're covering about five time zones here too with our peer group. So I'm coming from uh, Des Moines, Iowa. I'm Pastor Paul Whitmer. I'm the Minister of Reentry and Congregational Care uh, at the Iowa Correctional Institution for Women, uh, which is about 20 miles from where I sit right now uh, in Mitchellville, Iowa. Uh, I work with uh, the women inside the prison, and uh, as the Minister of Reentry, I oversee and coordinate a reentry ministry that's statewide uh, that pairs women with teams of locally trained uh, church people, people of faith mostly, uh, to work with them and to walk with them for their first year outside of prison as they leave the prison. We also have a worshiping community with inside the prison. Uh, and I'll talk more about that and how it's on hold right now because of COVID-19. So thank you. Back to Tiffany, I think. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank, thank all of you. Again, it's so wonderful to be with you this morning. So our first question this morning is about when and why did you join the peer group? And how has the peer group experience changed you? How has your ministry changed or grown over time because of your experience in the peer group? 
So we're gonna go in the same order. We're gonna use the same order for all the rounds of questions. So I'll go ahead and pass it to Sharon uh, for this first question. Thank you, Reverend Tiffany. Uh, as I said earlier, I am the executive director for Oklahoma Family Empowerment Center. And one of the reasons why we joined the peer group back, it was actually the first peer group that started in 2016. We joined that group because of our work um, as a social justice agency with reducing minority contact with law enforcement, namely juvenile uh, contact with law enforcement and working with the system stakeholders in order to uh, increase uh, that contact, because we found out that, of course, children across the board, juveniles, do not commit crimes uh, at a disproportionate rate. What we found was disproportionate was the way those individuals were being handled, and we found that minority kids were having more contact. So that was our first uh, uh, entry, if you will, to the prison and jail ministry peer group. And then, of course, we do also prison uh, post-release programming to assist returning citizens as they come back into the community that they can be successful um, in being with the peer group, especially when it relates to working with people, keeping them out of prison and keeping them out of uh, having contact with law enforcement and working with them once they return. We found out that that's a very lonely work. It's tiring work. It's hard work. And being part of the group, peer group has encouraged me, it has supported me, it's helped me to see and work with others who are also doing light work and to know that we're not at this alone. We're not doing this alone. And ultimately being part of the peer group, if you will, uh, has been able to make me stronger in this work, more committed in this work. Not only am I at this alone, but I'm learning other tools from our other peer group members of what we can do to help individuals navigate a system that is very difficult to navigate. Since joining the peer group, I have uh, been able to focus some of the work that Oklahoma Family Empowerment Center does to make it more focused in order to have it more client-centered in order to meet the needs that the clients have. We also have gathered valuable information and tools to help us be more successful as we work with those who are marginalized, especially those who have been involved in the prison and jail system. Without, uh, I think that's all I have for now and I'll pass it on to Alma Carr. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I second everything <laughs> that uh, Sharon said. Um, I joined uh, the peer group uh, in um, uh, August 20, uh, 2018, 2018. Um, Actually, the first peer group came to our hospitality house in Lompkin, Georgia, and we coordinated the visits with the, the first uh, peer group at the detention center and meeting with people um, uh, who are, you know, currently in the who were in the, the deportation proceedings at this facility. Um, that's how I uh, my first connection with MBA and and with the peer uh, group as um, became to be, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, a directly affiliated with MBA, but uh, I've received this uh, gracious invitation from, from uh, the conveners. Um, and, um, you know, as after uh, looking at the information and, and talking to, um, you know, my wife and family, I decided that this was a great opportunity for me personally to grow as a, as a, as a person who is um, working um, in our environment where you hear stories uh, that is very heavy uh, work. Um, and as Sharon said, sometimes a little lonely, even though you have an organization that back you, uh, you have um, a group of people that are doing amazing work with you. At the same time, um, there, there is sometimes uh, those spaces are as not as created uh, to allow us as uh, you know, people who are working directly with impacted individuals to uh, look at ourselves um, and reflect on how we're doing. I think one of the main things uh, that our team and, and the pre-group have provided me personally is that it's, you know, kind of revive, you know, review myself, how, how am I doing? What is it, what I'm, are my needs? Because sometimes we can just focus on the things that, you know, I'm doing, um, you know, what is it, what else can I, can I do to support the families that are, that we're assisting uh, who are, 
in this horrendous process of having their loved ones in detention and people who are incarcerated who you know face um, neglect and abuses uh, inside of the facility and, and, and for many their lives are completely destroyed. Um, but uh, sometimes you know we are like you know wanted to do more and more and and don't focus on ourselves and how things are going for, for ourselves. So for me it has been a great opportunity personally to go personally to um, take time to rest. Uh, to feel supported uh, from, 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 from others in, in the team, um, the peer group. Um, coming to the meetings, for example, I don't have to, you know, explain myself to everyone. I just, I'm just part of the team, uh, a group of people who are dedicated, who are, um, you know, working very hard to, you know, to assist and support and, and walk alongside those who are directly impacted. Um, so that's like just a given uh, an opportunity to just be uh, rather than explain or trying to do more. Um, and and that's, that's the amazing thing about this uh, 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 peer group. Um, one, one other thing that I will say that is, um, you, know, you know, taking care of ourselves um, it has been a, a great focus of this uh, team uh, and, and, and throughout our you know, almost two years uh, um, working on site together, um, and 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 that you know is something that I also have to have been able to bring to uh, the people that I work with, uh, and start to think about you know we need to revise revise how we're doing our work. Are we taking care of ourselves? You know, uh, we are dealing with post uh, uh, secondary trauma, and how we actually can be of support to uh, one another, and that opportunity. Um, you know, has been given to me because I'm part of these um, um, peer groups. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Nora. Oh, Car, thank you. Because I remember that first visit to your facility and to the prison in Lumpkin and how it really rocked my world um, and opened my eyes. Uh, that's one of the benefits of this peer group. Uh, I was part of the first cohort in 2016. And I had no idea what to expect. I actually thought it was gonna be about training and it was not about training. It was it, some training, but it was mostly about building these connections that the previous two folks have spoken about. The real power of this peer group has been in the connections and the mutual support that we've gotten and shared with one another. I started prison work in 2014 and it's restorative justice work happens in a circle of mutual respect. And the amazing thing about it is that uh, even in prison with a group, the energy is around building trust and support for one another. At the same time, the shame and guilt that comes out as people share their stories. It's really powerful. And so there are all these stories of pain, racism, abuse of power, sexism, power over, powerlessness under, just violence in general. And so um, as someone who's gone through seminary and chaplaincy training, I've learned a lot of self-care, but there is nothing like the power of our peers to not just share this, the powers of difficulty, but to get hope from one another, to see how we learn hope from one another. My work inside prison in those groups is to ask open-ended questions to help keep the circle emotionally safe because none of us is accustomed to doing any of this sort of work with others. And so emotional safety is important. And then to keep bringing the work back to that delicate balance between accountability and healing. One of the things I'll note is that I go into the prison as an educator, not as a minister of the gospel. That's how I'm categorized. The people in the groups, oh, actually we pick for a, var a variety of ages, um, major crimes of violence, diversity of violence, and diversity of um, the kinds of things that um, 
they bring to their own lives. So there's a diversity of religions. There's Christian, there's Roman Catholic, which is seen as, as Christian or different from Christian in prison. There is Muslim, there's Jew, there is um, Native American, there's Odinist, uh, the sort of out of the Viking tradition. And so um, having an interfaith background in my work and a view that uh, God created us all and created us all good, no exceptions, um, has really informed what I do in prison. And the people in the peer group have their own experiences of this. So I'm able to draw on, on all of that. So I would say that my ministry has changed because there are others who understand me, others who give me hope, give me specific techniques, give me a place to call and scream to, and I don't have to go through a whole lot of explanation. Thank God for the NBA. You know, if we're going to be a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world, when we become fragmented, we need a place to go. That's what this cohort has provided. So with that, Paul. Amen. Thank you, Nora. Uh, I've heard a lot of things I'm saying amen to. So I think it's it's part of the beauty of being part of this group. So I came to this work in 2016. Uh, I was a local church pastor uh, for the first 25 years of my ordained ministry and, and really never thought I'd be in a prison ministry setting. But so I found myself doing it part time in 2016. I joined this cohort in 2018. Uh, but my coworker, my colleague and the lead pastor at Women at the Well was in the first cohort. So she was a, a partner with Nora and Apostle Sharon and Tiffany. Uh, Lee Schott was the pastor there. And uh, I saw her participating in that. And then she sort of uh, nudged me to think about it. And I think she encouraged MBA to invite me to join the next cohort, which I did. Uh, and one of the things I can remember about this work, when I came into doing a doing it full time, I took on this reentry ministry of helping women prepare to leave prison and, and have success on the outside. I kept like almost every day I'd wake up overwhelmed, not knowing what I was doing. And I was like, I don't know anything about anything. And I kept telling Pastor Lee, I don't, I'm asking people I've never met to do something I've never done. Uh, and she kept saying, you have to stop saying that. <laughs> Because I'd get up in front of people and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. And she, it's, you know, she's like, you have to stop saying that. <clears throat> and I did stop saying that eventually. It was true for a long time. And I think there was some real humility in that. But there's also a time when you have to just uh, live into the, the new normal, the reality of this new work. Uh, just because it's new doesn't mean I don't know anything about it. So I came up with these three A words, uh, AAA for the, what, the, what the cohort meant to me, and it was accountability, affirmation, and alliance. Uh, it's not an accountability group, so I was a little uh, tentative in that one, but, but when you join a group like this and you commit to show up for each other once a month, uh, that, there, there's just built-in accountability. I don't need a lot of accountability in my life, but I really appreciate it where it shows up for me and where there are people, uh, colleagues, uh, <clears throat> allies in ministry that will show up for me. Uh, you know, when I said I'm going to be there uh, to the best of my ability once a month and, and to make these trips, uh, that was important, you know, and <clears throat> it's one of the things that, you know, ironically, when I when preparing women to leave prison to think about how they want to have success on the outside, accountability might be a big part of that. Are you accountable? Do you have people who will hold you accountable? Uh, are there people who, uh, for whom you hold accountable? So uh, I just found that that was an interesting overlap in the work I was trying to uh, teach uh, and, and adapt for myself. Uh, and the affirmation I've heard a lot of, that's why I wanted to say amen to everything I've heard already, because uh, there's just an acceptance and an affirmation in, in what we're doing. Uh, and I heard Apostle Sharon say it's lonely work. You know, a lot of this justice work could be very lonely. Uh, so to have, <clears throat> to be affirmed and have these allies is just a beautiful thing. Uh, and, and to come slowly come to be able to say, you know, I do know some things about some stuff <laughs> and I can teach and recruit people to do this work. Uh, so that to be affirmed in that was very positive. And then just to have allies, you know, I don't think there's there's just nothing like this justice work, uh, particularly that that has a particular shape in prison and jail ministry. So to be with other people uh, 
as I think uh, Amilcar said, where you don't have to explain yourself, you know, you can just unload, you can just breathe in and breathe out and let go, you know, and, uh, and people who are other people who are doing justice work in prison and jail ministry, uh, they know that it's not like local church ministry, it's not preaching, it's not parish ministry. Uh, it's different. It has a different shape to it. Uh, so there's something, you know, to build community among others who are doing that work was very uh, life-giving and transformative to me. So again, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you all. I can say amen to all of that as well. Um, so our, our next question, our next substantive question is um, to tell us more about your ministries and your justice work that you do. And um, given the context that we are all living through, also importantly, how do you see COVID-19 impacting your work and the call to justice in this time? So we're going to go in our same order. So Apostle Sharon. Thank you, Tiffany. Once, here I am once again, and I'm just excited about all that is going on. I'm excited about what Oklahoma Family Empowerment Center has done with the prison and jail ministry cohort through the National Benevolence Association. As I mentioned, it is uh, hard and lonely work, but it's also necessary work. So the necessary work that Oklahoma Family Empowerment Center does as a social service agency, we use this tagline empowering families, changing lives, and transforming our community. And we do that because we are working with those who are vulnerable. Uh, we work with people who are homeless, people who are living with food insecurities, people who are working through mental health addictions and addictions. We, most of those individuals we find are people who are returning from incarceration or either on parole or on probation individuals who come back from prison don't have good family support often and need assistance navigating in uh, the system and getting settled once again. So those are the things that Oklahoma Family Empowerment Center does. We do education. We work with parenting classes. We work and provide marriage and relationship education classes. We do domestic violence education classes. In addition, we serve hot meals, Monday through Thursday, breakfast and lunch. We have a food pantry to help people when they're working through food insecurity. So yes, we do prison and jail ministry first on the front end with working with individuals to keep them from going to prison and for those who are coming out to help them navigate and be successful. And we work with the marginalized in in areas of homelessness, uh, food insecurity, health uh, and, mental, and addictions. One of the other things that we are really uh, pushing forward is to help change policy. Because while we're doing all this great work, we're finding out that uh, we see this circle going on. So we're working on reducing mass incarceration. We're working at, at looking at laws and policies that adversely affect uh, marginalized communities. We're looking at the fact that we don't have enough uh, mental health beds, in, especially in Oklahoma. We don't have enough substance abuse uh, uh, beds. So when we find individuals who we're working to get them off the streets and get them into mental health counseling, we want to increase um, the number of beds because often when we work with them, as soon as we say, yes, they're ready to go, we can't find a bed for them. Uh, to get into counseling. So those are the things that we're working with. And each day we laugh because we have several partners that we work with uh, to do the work that we do because we can't do everything. So we partner with other agencies to help us do what we cannot do. And one of those things is to help people who are homeless because oftentimes when people come home from uh, being incarcerated, they don't have a home to go to and they, we find themselves they find themselves homeless. So we're working to help people get off the streets and get into a permanent address. As I said, we want to make sure that they have an address to call home. And so we're working on that. And I'm, I have this running joke that every time we get a place for someone to call home and they get their keys and we know that they're gonna have their own 
residents. We want them to ring a bell and say they're out because they won't have to come to the center each day for breakfast and lunch. How has COVID uh, impacted our work that call us to justice? One, we're finding out that because of COVID, we have an increased number of clients that we are serving, increased number of people who need food, increased number of individuals who are on the streets who are homeless. We have an increased need to, to release nonviolent offenders. Many of them are in prison for dr simple drug possession, which in many states is now legal, especially marijuana, uh, back into the community. We see that the reduction efforts uh, did not stop COVID uh, where we work with people. So well, just because COVID happened doesn't mean that people weren't still hungry. Just because COVID happened didn't mean that we didn't need to continue with the reduction efforts to keep young people from having contact with law enforcement. In some cases, we see that even has increased. We see a need for increased services provided while also experiencing a decrease in staff because Many of our staff are paid through uh, programs such as AmeriCorps or uh, AARP uh, Community Service. And because of COVID, many of those individuals cannot come on site. So I've been down here cooking breakfast and lunch, and we've had some people from the church coming to volunteer. So we've had increased need with less staff uh, because of COVID. So. Uh, I am excited about what is happening. I'm grateful for what MBA has done as far as providing the peer groups. I pray that that continues to happen. And one thing that I did not say in the first round of discussions is that MBA provided retreats for rest and relaxation. Don't stop it because this work is hard work. It's lonely work. And there's time when you need to pull back and rest so you can come back and be refueled. So with that said, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Alma Carr, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. Um, El Refugio is an organization that um, uh, it started to work uh, with uh, families and people detained at this facility uh, in 2010. Uh, we founded this organization after experiencing um, after visiting people at the detention center and getting to know the stories, um, uh, the neglect, uh, the abuse that happened, um, the lack of resources, um, is towards one of, I mentioned uh, uh, in my first intervention, is one of the largest detention centers in the United States for immigration purposes. Um, it has the capacity to detain up to 2,000 people. And it is it is far from the city. It is about two and a half hours from the city of Atlanta, and it serves um, the the region. So it serves people who are detained in the Carolinas and Georgia. Um, so you you know can have families who you know make a journey to visit their loved ones for one hour, uh, one hour a week. Um, uh, you know driving six hours, eight hours to get to the facility, uh, and because it's a very small town, uh, there is more people in the detention center than the city of Lumpkin itself. Um, because the, the city has about 1300 people who lives in, in, in the city of Lumpkin. The, there are no hotels, um, there are no facilities, uh, uh, opportunities for families to you know, you know, find support. And that was um, what we found uh, with our first interactions with people. Uh, we started to see families who were making the journey from you know, Charlotte, North Carolina, from Durham, drove eight hours, families who came from Maryland, New York, uh, Florida, and Texas uh, to visit their loved ones. Because um, even though it's a regional facility that serves uh, the Carolina, Carolinas in Georgia, uh, there are a, a, a good amount of people who are sent, uh, who are apprehended at the border or asylum seekers who are detained at the border um, and immigration uh, basically takes them into custody while uh, uh, you know, they decide about their case. Um, so um, our work uh, is focused on providing hospitality to the families. That's our main, uh, one of our main services, providing hospitality, lodging, free lodging and meals to family who visit their loved ones. So at least that one thing they don't have to worry about uh, they had to make, uh, you know, the, the journey and, and expenses just to, you know, go to the detention center. Plus the, you know, 
lawyers fees my son is here in my <laughs> in the background um and uh we also this is people detained uh, people who are detained at the facility and we've been also providing assistance to people who are uh, released from the facility those are our main goals um, to offer in, in that service to families uh, to people detained uh, and also educating the community about the immigration issues um, COVID has changed our work uh, dramatically um, uh, from, you know, our, we, we had to, you know, close the house uh, right now. So we're, we, we can offer hospitality to families. Visitation is also not happening in any facilities uh, and, you know, for, you know, obvious reasons. Um, but we've been super busy uh, providing assistance to the families who have loved ones in detention. We've been able to send uh, care packages to the families. Uh, we know that immigrant communities don't have the you know the support from the government they don't get any stimulus check um so and this is a male facility most likely the person who is detained is the person who provided for the family um and you know you basically have uh, entire families who don't have a way to pay their bills um and COVID make it more complicated because even if they were working uh they are now finding you know uh, themselves without work or if they're essential workers, they had to still find you know, childcare for the kids. There's a lot that happened in the immigrant community. Um, so we were able to assist families in that way. We're sending care packages to them. Uh, we made a, a list of resources. Uh, so we also send that with them. So if you live in North Carolina, we look for resources in the area so they can uh, go to those organizations that are providing more assistance to them. Uh, um, because of the reality of visitation, uh, the cancellation of visitation, and because of the abuses that happened inside a detention center, when COVID started, uh, and when we learned about the first cases of COVID at the facility, um, the people detained told us that there is no soap in this facility, there is no mask, they don't provide those things to us. And slowly, ICE started to provide uh, some of those things to people in detention, that is not enough. Um, and when people complain about the conditions inside of the detention center, um, you know, they are, you know, retaliated against. People are placed in solitary confinement. Uh, you know, people were pepper sprayed, you know, they threw on uh, gas bombs to them. Uh, um, so the whole situation inside is very dire for people in detention. So we've been doing a lot more advocacy for their release. Um, there is a class action lawsuit that, you know, or, organizations are filed together with El Refugio and um, basically uh, with this lawsuit um, ICE has to immigration and customs informants have to revise the custody of the, the individuals especially those who have medical uh, conditions uh, underlying conditions um, so we've been doing some of that you know advocating directly for for their release uh, we've seen uh, particularly people who have medical conditions like we've been assisting people who have uh, one person who, who was diagnosed with cancer another person who is older and has other medical conditions who was released from detention um which is good they're not you know they they're not incarcerated but at the same time they need a lot of assistance uh so we've been providing lodging in hotels and, and airbnbs and connecting with people in the community we've been looking for sponsors to assist them because we believe that people should be released from detention. You know, their 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 uh, immigration offense is a civil offense. They should not be incarcerated. They should have the ability to go to their families in their communities. And um, we, you know, we want them to know that, um, you know, eyes to know that they they should release uh, those individuals. Um, this is, has been the work. Uh, we are super busy looking for. You know, advocating for more folks uh, for their release um, and providing all the assistance that we can uh, while our hospitality house is closed. Um, you know, we remain committed to the families and the people who are you know, detained at the door. Um, and together with our advocates here in Georgia, um, we continue to uh, call in Congress um, and investigate the reality uh, in detention centers and the abuses that people are facing currently in the facility. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Nora. 
Thank you so much to, to both of you who have shared so far. I just want to interject briefly before um, Nora jumps in with all this powerful testimony that you're hearing um, about the ministries. I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, you're welcome to put those questions into the chat box for the participants, and we'll have time at the end for a short Q&A. So thank you to both of you who have shared so far about your powerful work, and I'll pass it now to Nora. Thanks, Tiffany. And Amilcar, thank you. I'm going to answer this question uh, in reverse order. I wanted to uh, start by saying how COVID-19 has affected my prison work. COVID-19 has um, is confusing for people who are restorative justice practitioners because everything is in circle. And so I haven't been able to go into the prison since early March. And the California Institution for Men, one of the 34, 33 prisons in California, was the first really to be reporting the full numbers uh, of the outbreak there. So uh, I took two weeks to grieve personally, and then I went to the community resources manager of that prison and said um, something that's been one of my private secret wishes. How about if we do a restorative justice reading group? She put it on pause for a while, but then I went back and lo and behold, um, this Louise Erdrich's La Rose, this novel has been the, the focus of what we've been able to do. They, the prison folks said, yes, uh, I created curriculum around that book and all the great questions of accountability, um, shame and guilt and avoidance of responsibility and denial and uh, cultural backgrounds and diversity. And so um, it's very 19th century. I hand carry the lesson to the prison every week in 29 different envelopes. Those get carried over to the cell blocks, uh, the yard where uh, I usually have been uh, facilitating. The men <clears throat> read and write their answers and they are clearly still doing their work. It's really powerful. So that's the tangibleness. The intangible is that they know that they're still connected to something bigger. They know that they're still doing their work to go to the parole board eventually. They know that the circle looks different, but it's still there. And that's, that's really powerful. In the outside world, everything else has exploded. Um, I've I'm the co-founder and community coordinator for a coalition of 35 to 45 different organizations that provide some sort of re-entry support and, um, and referral to returning citizens. And so we've amped up those efforts. Think about it, parole agents and probation officers also are in quarantine like all of us were socially distanced working from home. How do they know what the resources out there, especially because there are a lot of new staff coming on right now, a lot of retirees because the budgets have dropped. So we've amped up our work in two ways. One, we've added outreach specifically to parole and probation about what resources are there. The big one was how do people get their driver's licenses after coming out of prison? if their licenses have been suspended or um, taken away. There was a whole uh, process that our uh, Department of Motor Vehicles went through that was changing almost day by day. So we were strong in making sure everybody was notified. We're also now, um, in order to be better advocates and um, policy influencers, the Pomona reentry community is joining with Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership, which is the um, the giant among reentry networks in California, they have a place at the table in Sacramento, and we're there. One of their first outreaches, they're bringing us in as we speak. So that's been one really exciting dimension. In Pomona, there's been this whole movement for restorative practices. So another resource I wanted to make you aware of, all of us, which is to say people from churches, people from nonprofits, people from mental health, people from a uh, police department uh, are all working and the school district, that's an important one, getting training from the 
International Institute of Restorative Practices. This is the handbook they give us as we train. And I'm part of a, a team, a leadership team that's getting people to learn how to practice by practicing with one another. And so um, that's been powerful, making a whole new circle of friends and colleagues in that work that's very strengthening. Um, continue to coordinate Urban Mission Community Partners Inside Out Art Program, which in which people who are incarcerated or have been incarcerated um, have the opportunity to exhibit and show their work and have us discuss it, maybe sell it, um, to look at and discuss the questions of restoration versus punishment, of um, mercy rather than stigma. Um, and so that, that has been also really revitalizing because our board of directors has been amplified to include people who have uh, who are in fact people with lived experience, which is what we're calling, we used to call FIP, formerly incarcerated persons, old language. The language is people with lived experience and to have their voices on our board of directors and in the way we do the work that we do if we're truly going to be a community-based organization. So with that, I'll again turn to Paul. Thanks, Nora. Uh, <clears throat> gosh. Yeah, so Women at the Well is a, uh, a prison congregation. It was started as a prison congregation uh, 13, 14 years ago now. Uh, and Prison Congregations of America is a particular model of doing ministry. I had several members of our cohort that were also serving similar churches. Uh, I think this is real important distinction to, to sort of to highlight <clears throat> with women at the well. We're not a church on the outside that comes in and, and gives these women religion uh, and say, we're the church, we have a message for you, here's the gospel. But instead it comes into the church and starts a church within uh, a congregation within that prison community. Uh, this highlights an important thing. I hear this a lot, at least in Iowa and the Department of Corrections. There's a lot of, uh, I think, very positive movement in this direction of being gender-based. Uh, having gender-based care, trauma-informed care, uh, and sort of the underlying uh, messages in all of that is giving these women, well, first of all, understanding that women prisoners are different than men prisoners. Okay, wow, <laughs> that seems pretty basic, but, uh, and, and to treat them the same way uh, does, the, does them both injustice. So, uh, and then uh, trauma-informed care, uh, really focuses on collaboration, giving women voice, giving them choice. Uh, all of those things sort of fit uh, just hand in hand with the model of prison congregations of giving them, empowering them to be decision makers, having this be their ministry, their church, they could decide uh, what worship looks like, uh, what Bible study looks like, you know, they set a mission and a vision for their church. Uh, our vision as Women at the Well is to break, uh, to lead the church in love that breaks down walls. I just think that's a beautiful vision, especially coming from inside the church. And again, how empowering is that, that this group of women inside a prison in, in Iowa uh, has the audacity to say they're leading the church. Uh, and it's true. In a lot of ways, they are leading the church uh, in love that breaks down walls. Uh, so what we do, <clears throat> uh, again, giving them voice and choice, they get a lot to say in how we do worship. We worship inside uh, the prison. We have two worship services as part of the prison uh, population, uh, and they help lead worship and they preach occasionally. Uh, that's that's pre-COVID. Another thing that's pre-COVID that's more under the the part of my work around re-entry is that we have a re-entry workshop every Wednesday afternoon. Uh, every Wednesday uh, in the sacred place, <clears throat> uh, some, some designated class space set aside just for this purpose. Uh, women come in who are going to be leaving prison and, you know, sometime in the next year uh, to really do, and, and we, we, we develop a 12-week curriculum uh, that, that's biblically based uh, roughly around the story of the prodigal son and his return and, and looking at some of his experience in that very important gospel story. Of, and what can we learn from that about 
uh, self-discovery. There's a moment in that parable where he comes to himself and he realizes, you know, it's kind of a rock bottom moment. Uh, and what a key moment that is for all of us to have that rock bottom moment when we come to ourselves and start making different decisions about the future we want to walk into. Uh, it deals with reconciliation, uh, broken relationships, uh, <clears throat> recovery. And uh, so that's all of the things that we sort of uh, explore in our reentry workshop every Wednesday afternoon. Uh, that also was a pre-COVID thing. So COVID comes along and basically shuts us down in terms of traffic in and out of the prison for very good reason, right? So if they can eliminate traffic in and out of the prison, they're going to mitigate against a COVID outbreak. So the good news on that is the, the women's prison in Mitchellville has zero positive cases of COVID. So I'm very glad for that. The bad news is we haven't seen those women uh, and had any interaction with them uh, since early March, just like Nora said in her setting. Uh, we have been able to provide some devotional material, some written, just to stay in touch with them. Uh, again, as Nora says, to let them know they're not alone, they're, they're part of something bigger. Uh, so we've sent in uh, <clears throat> devotional materials that sort of help explore that. Uh, with them, explore our worship themes that are still going on, even though we're not worshiping with them inside. We're trying to develop some digital content because we are worshiping online on Facebook every Thursday night. You can come see us uh, at Women at the Well Facebook page. Uh, that's reaching a lot of people out in the community, a lot of our partners, partner churches. Uh, and here's a kind of a, a blessing of COVID-19. We're connecting with women who have left prison on Facebook. They're, they're able to worship with us. Uh, and that wasn't happening before COVID. So that's really kind of a, a a really cool thing. Uh, well, I'll be preaching along in Facebook <clears throat> live, uh, and I'll see comments from women that have left prison uh, and are now are in uh, different parts of Iowa or in Florida even. Uh, so that's been really cool to have them worship with us. Uh, we're trying to, to work with the prison to get digital content like that. We can put that on a DVD or a flash drive, send it inside, let them play it on the, on the internal uh, closed circuit TV where they have a religious programming. Uh, that's, and I think there's openness to it. There's just a, it's low on the priorities right now with COVID. Uh, I think if, as, as we see this time expanding, I mean, I don't think any of us are going back anytime soon. So I really think digital content is going to have to be a, a venue that we explore. And I think the prison will be open to that. So that's what we're looking forward to. One of the key experiences, I'll, I'll just finish with this, with, uh, with being part of this cohort was uh, attending uh, an in-person gathering. We were at uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona, and MBA provided uh, leadership for an event, an anti-racism event that explored. And I just heard a lot of language. It, it, it reiterated what, we, what I already knew through some of the gender-based care and trauma-informed care that we were doing. Uh, some of the, <clears throat> the rubric for that anti-racism thing, training, uh, it, it, it talked about intersectionality. It talked about cooperation and collaboration. Uh, it talked about both and thinking over against either or. Uh, and I just had a great eye-opening eye experience for that for myself. I and a lot of the people I think in our culture think uh, that in the criminal justice system, there are criminals and there are victims. Uh, and we in the prison work with the criminals and people on the outside uh, work with the victims. Uh, well, what I've learned at, at this women's prison anyway is that 98% of justice involved women uh, have suffered trauma in their life. They are, have been victimized by sexual trauma, physical abuse, uh, you name it, 98%. That's, I don't, I'm not real good with math, but that's almost everybody, right? So here I am serving a prison congregation of women who are criminals, and we don't deny that they have committed criminal acts, but 98% of them had been victimized before they committed that crime. So here we have a both end. Uh, and to be able to minister in that setting uh, with that sort of both end thinking, building collaboration and cooperation, uh, thinking about abundance instead of scarcity. These are things that, you know, that was a very transformative experience with me through NBA and this cohort. So uh, I'm very grateful for that and to be able to, to lift that up as a, as a life-changing thing for my ministry uh, where I get to lead a church that's leading the church in love that breaks down walls. So thank you. Thank you, Paul.
So we have one more question before we open it up in case there are any questions from our audience, our participants. And so this is our, our ask. So we're gonna go around and answer, what is one thing that anyone can do right now to support your mission in some way? So I will pass it to Apostle Sharon Cosby. Again, she is the Executive Director of Oklahoma Family Empowerment Center to give us her ask. Well, please allow me. My ask has a couple of parts, but it is one ask. And the ask is, while everybody may not be a boots on the ground person to get involved in the work, but anybody can write a letter or pick up the phone. And I am asking for individuals who are interested and have a concern about the work to pick up the phone or write a letter to their congressperson or their representative to do one of the three things. And that, that this is my three parts to my one ask. As long as there's a profit margin where private sectors can uh, build prisons and that can be traded on the stock market and people are making money uh, in incarcerating people, we will continue to see people being incarcerated at disproportionate numbers. So we need to reduce the number of individuals who are being uh, put in prison and the, part, the profit margin needs to be taken out of that. With people who have mental health, uh, diseases and addictions, which often people who have mental health issues use drugs and alcohol to uh, medicate their mental health issue, that should not be a criminal offense. So we have in our prisons a lot of people who are dealing with mental health addictions and they are being put in prison. So we need to set up a system where people are not going to prison for mental health issues or drug addiction, but are diverted to community programming. I was in a conversation with the Tulsa County Sheriff and he said his jail is becoming more of a place where he's holding people uh, for drugs and alcohol or people with mental health because he can't get them into mental health beds. So let's write our representatives and ask them to increase funding for more mental health beds, more funding for more uh, substance abuse beds and to decrease mass incarceration by taking the profit margin out of putting people in prison. That's my ask. Thank you so much. Thank Out you. our car. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Again, this is Mr. Amilcar Valencia, and he's the executive director of El Refugio Ministries. Thanks. I will uh, second uh, what Sharon said. Um, if we really want to um, really fight for uh, those who are incarcerated, uh, those who are detained by immigration, um, we need to advocate for that release. Uh, and one of the things that one of the things that we can do is. Um, uh, well, there, there are many things we can do and just like the easy thing should be like pick up your phone, call your congressman, email them, let them know uh, that you are concerned about the conditions inside of the facility. You are concerned about people getting infected because there is no, no way they can, you know, social distance in, themselves from others in the facility. Um, and that people are not receiving the treatment they need. Um, we should be able to go to families or communities. Um, uh, and, 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 and go forward with that, I think is also a direct call to um, Congress to investigate um, what happened in the facilities, the treatment they receive, and also to reduce um, the amount of money that is put into the buckets of CBP and ICE uh, that are incarcerating, uh, you know, high rates of uh, number of people every year. Uh, and then we're spending a lot of money, our tax, you know, money is going to Civic and all these corporations are making money for uh, the attention of, of immigrants. Um, um, so those, that's one thing we could do also to release people from attention. We need, um, you know, we need people who donate to organizations that are doing the work um, and uh, bond funds who are 
you know, pain for the release of individuals, uh, organizations that are looking for post-release, you know, consider that uh, as part of our, our, our mission and ministry at the church uh, to provide uh, that kind of assistance. So people can, um, you know, really go back to their communities, go back to their families um, and continue their process, but they don't have to be uh, in a detention setting where uh, things are, you know, blown out of proportion in terms of the conditions and the treatment inside of the facility. And they can continue to, uh, you know, be part of our communities, our churches, um, and, and not being criminalized because they were not born here because they have immigration issues, because um, you know they come here seeking protection, seeking asylum, and, and then we traumatize or further traumatize them, uh, especially those who are you know, fleeing persecution in the home countries, um, violence in Central America, or the drugs cartels, or any other kind of violence uh, that they're fleeing to. And in, in our country and our immigration laws are designed to keep them separate, to separate them, keep them apart. Uh, and then we're spending a lot of money into the wall and policies that are uh, dismantling uh, a system that is already broken, um, but, um, but that we can do something. We can call our members of Congress. We can use our voices uh, uh, to speak on behalf of those people who are, um, currently in detention and their families who are struggling uh, because their, their loved ones are incarcerated. Um, Nora. Thank you again. This is Reverend Nora Jacob and she is the Restorative Justice Director and the current Acting Executive Director of Urban Mission Community Partners. Thank you, Tiffany. Amilcar, thank you again. Sharon as well. I want to take a little bit different tack I think one of the things that we need to keep doing, and I always think about doing things in community. So yes, you can do this for yourself, but it's more powerful in community to watch the movie 13th and then go online and find a study guide and work the study guide with others. This works well on Zoom to do a watch party and then do it. What I like about this is that there's a page about Jesus was a prisoner and then there are all sorts of action items uh, that fall into the different areas that, that Apostle Sharon and Emil Carr have already talked about. Beyond that, I really urge you to think about language. What Paul said was to talk about the importance of going from either or to both and. There is that. And there is also the question and the issue of how do we show and live out the reality that people are human beings first, beloved of God in, in my way of believing first, and then what they did or what was done to them is, is part of their story. So yes, it's extra wording to say a person who committed murder rather than a murderer. Yes a person who did a bad thing rather than a bad guy. Think about how young children are when they start hearing the words bad guy and good guy and what images and experiencing experiences those are tied to. Honestly, that's a real concern for me because we shorthand everything in this society. People get impatient with me because I use that every single time a man who, a person who, someone whose journey is interrupted by incarceration. Oh, he's a rapist. You know what? When you hear the whole story, just as, as Paul said, really almost everyone has had, who's committed major harm has had major harm done to them first. And so if we are indeed to follow the example of Jesus and others who have led the way in healing individuals and societies in, in movements, we need to work individually to start with, change ourselves, and then find like-minded others to circle up and change the world. Thank you. Thank Paul? You know, yeah. So important, especially right now, as we're changing some of these dialogues in our, in our society. 
-hmm. So this is again is past Pastor Paul Whitmer, and he is the Minister of Reentry and Congregational Care for Women at the Well. Thanks. So I'm going to borrow my ask from a formerly incarcerated woman who I heard uh, address a national gathering of people who were interested in criminal justice reform, reentry, uh, you know, support. Uh, and at the end of a couple of hours together with her, you know, people are asking, what can we do? What can we do? Uh, and what she encouraged people to do was talk to your neighbor. <laughs> that kind of blew me away. I mean, who do I write? Who do I call? Where do I send money? All these things that everyone's sort of talking about. How do I get involved? My boots. Are... And I think what she said was so uh, wise about how we change uh, the world, the systems, uh, even the criminal justice system, is we talk to our neighbor. And I think what she said there was, what she means by that is, do you even know your neighbor? Because in order to have a conversation with your neighbor, you have to know your neighbor. So, uh, you know, get out of your house, get beyond your four walls uh, and build some relationship. That's where community organizing is really uh, that's where the that's where it happens and and it and it really uh uh just kind of opened my eyes to an, an amazing sort of strategy right to talk to our neighbors to be neighborly uh, <clears throat> it sounds almost uh mr rogers ish but it's also quite prophetic i don't know if you've ever heard walter brueggemann uh speak about the, the old testament prophets and and he can boil he boils it down to being neighborly right <clears throat> the good samaritan being the neighbor uh so that's my ask is that we all uh know our neighbors talk to them uh if we uh, i met my one of my neighbors i met uh at a, here we are in iowa and iowa caucuses is a real thing and, and i met our 94 year old neighbor at an Iowa caucus they were caucusing for Hillary Clinton <clears throat> and I was caucusing for one of those other people uh along those lines and and it's just like it was so awesome and, and so now we're connected in a in a very neighborly way right in a justice way in a voting way and that we care about our community kind of way and we care what happens uh, and I think people leaving prison, <clears throat> that's what's going to change for them is if they know their neighbors uh, and they live in a place where people are willing to know their name and have a conversation with them uh, about what's important to them. So that's the easiest ask. And it's also probably the hardest because it's very personal and it's relational. Thank you, Paul. Yes. So again, thank you to all of you. It's been wonderful hearing from all of you and hearing your, your wisdom and your insights and just your, your passion and the work that you are all doing in your own ways, in your own context for compassion and justice and liberation. So thank you so much. Um, looks like the only question that we have from the audience is just to share those asks and those resources that you all shared with us. Um, and so we will make sure that that happens. And um, yeah, thank you all again so much for everything that you've shared. Uh, oh, actually, okay, we do have a question now. <laughs> so the question is, what can you share about how you weather the political storms that you encounter? So um, any of you feel free to jump in if you wanna answer that question. I assume, I'm not sure exactly if that's related to prison policy or politics more broadly, but um, yeah. I'll take a stab at that, or Nora can too, but <clears throat> we, and Nora works in an institution, a lot of us work in institutions that are, uh, you know, run by the government, and it's challenging, you know, we're doing ministry uh, in a, in in our little world within a bigger world that that's run by the Department of Corrections. And there are just changes, you know, every administration comes along and I'm not talking about governors or presidents, I'm talking about wardens and counselors and people who oversee, you know, volunteer coordinators. When, when people change in those positions, uh, that's, it's, it can be like a, weathering a storm. I mean, there's, there's different standards, there's different rules, different protocols. Uh, it changes our status. You know, we went from being one status to being volunteers, and 
Uh, so it just, it takes sort of seeing the long, having the long game in mind and, and knowing uh, that arc that bends towards justice and, and patience and perseverance is what I would say. So I'm going to let Nora weigh in because I think she was going to say something too. Well, it looks like maybe Nora's um, frozen. So is, is there anyone else who wants to respond to that? I'll make one comment. And when the tides change, I believe that I'm called to stay the course and to keep the focus on what the issue is at hand. And that is to be a voice for those who don't have a voice, be a presence for those who need presence, and to continue to work on behalf of those who are in the margins, especially those who find themselves in prisons and jails or who have come out and are needing assistance. So my job, no matter what happens in the political arena, I am to stay the course and to recognize what I am called to do. And what I'm called to do doesn't matter who's uh, in the Congress, doesn't matter who's in the White House, doesn't matter who's the governor, who's the mayor, I am to stay the course. And so for each one of us, I think, and of course I'm a preacher, so uh, you know that's where I land. If God has called me to do this, no matter what everybody else does, I am to do what God has called me to do. So to stay the course. Political storms come and go, but I am to stay the course. Amen. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I think I will pass it back to Hector to close our time together. Again, thank you all. Yeah, it seems like we lost um, Nora. Um, so um, she might be able to connect back or not, we'll see. But um, thank you, thank you, thank you very much to all speakers. Um, we, are, we are more than blessed by your work and we are honored by your presence here today. I feel so blessed, so blessed and honored for being part of all your journeys. So, so I'm, uh, my my heart is warm, and 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 I, you know, continue doing this together. Um, so, some of you already have took advantage, but if by any chance at this point you didn't see that, um, we'll invite you to to go to the chat box. Um, we have been sharing links of all their ministries uh, represented here, all the websites and, and telephones and information of, of, of the ministries represented here. And the idea is that you can uh, connect with, with those ministries. You can visit their, their websites. And the idea is that you discover more about their ministries and how they are creating justice in their local communities. Um, I was looking at, at the discussions and we're going to be sharing that also via email. Um, and we definitely, especially after listening to, to the clear asks, our, our goal uh, is that, and we encourage all of you to take whatever action you can, whatever action you can in supporting the causes of justice and equity for all. Today, we're also asking uh, all of you to join MBA in our work of creating justice. And there is a very simple way. There is a way in which you can be in, involved and you can stay informed uh, of our work. And it's simple as reaching out to mbacares.org or .org slash enews and for you to sign up for our newsletter. You will see when you get into that, that there are gonna be a few check boxes that you need to mark, letting us, letting us know uh, what are the areas of interest. Um, you will see prison and jail ministries there. You will see advocacy and activism and, and there are other topics. So feel free to mark all of them if, if you want. 
And that way you will be connected, connected with, with all the things that are happening in MBA and all the, those communities that we are connecting and that we are part of. Um, the other easy thing that you can do is um, on Facebook, you can search for and join the MBA Prison and Jail Ministry Group. It, it, is, it is uncanny. There are over 400 members who share their stories, news, and educational articles to support one another in their works. So be part of that group, be part of that experience. In addition to that, we invite you to come back in August when we will be hosting a new webinar on voter registration and voter right efforts. We will even have a great, and I have seen it so I can say it, a great toolkit for congregation to help address voter registration in your homestead. Home state, I meant to say. We encourage you to visit the resources, uh, the resource section on our website when we have multiple education materials, articles, videos, and worship ideas so that you can access for free and that you can share with your uh, community, family, and, and congregation. And I will tell you even more. As part of uh, the Disciples Just Summer event, hashtag DOC Just Summer event, the prison and jail ministry peer group, the cohort that is right now, um, uh, you know, going through the end of their journey. That amazing group has put together a few liturgies. One of the liturgies in particular is centered into uh, immigration and detention centers. And it has even music. We're grateful for Reverend Better Hill Soto from Indianapolis who helped us with one of the songs and we did it in two languages. So we really encourage you to go and check that, check those options, uh, those liturgies. And by the way, I'm, I'm not sure if I was supposed to say anything, but we are working on two more liturgies that um, as soon as they're completed, um, we're gonna be sharing with the church that those liturgies are part of our peer group uh, project. Finally, we ask, we ask you for your support. Oops, sorry. I plan for everything but that. <laughs> uh, we ask you for your support. Let me see if I can remember where I was in the script. Um, okay. And as we all know, the year 2020, I mean, it, it will be an understatement to say that 2020 has been a very difficult year on all fronts. <laughs> that will be an understatement. So, so we ask for your generous gift help um, your I mean your generous gifts will help MBA support our peer learning and wellness groups whom you met today you met some of the members here today your contributions also help us uh, your donations also support our various grant programs such as our COVID-19 MBA respond grants and we are very grateful for these blessings and, and, and we're very grateful for your collaboration. So thank you for your time today. Please reach out to us. Let's, let's know your story. Let's connect each, you know, with each other. We are grateful for, for who you are and we wanna know more. And we hope to see you again on all our next events. And may the hope center in Christ, the liberator, renew your strength so you could keep fighting for justice and equity so you can keep doing your part. Thank you once again for, to all the speakers. Amen. And may God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.